So, uh, good morning to all of you and uh, thank you for coming. And I understand it's like uh, 10 o'clock is early by literature standards and people are still trickling in. But we'll start, uh, it, it's a long day of, you know, you'll hear a lot of speakers as well. So, uh, some of my first interactions with uh, uh, Debashish has been uh, reading some of his works. And of course, I've been to I am Cory Court several times. Uh, at times, we did some client uh, training programs there, which I was part of. And then I spoke several times to the students of various batches, uh, a couple of, couple of conferences out there, etc. cetera. Uh, what has always amazed me is uh, uh, his ability to blend a lot of uh, Indian thought into uh, I am Cory Court. And it's one of the best campuses that I have seen in India. And uh, so it's, a, it's been, uh, I think it's, it's, it's something like a fanboy moment. Uh, I have looked at IMK from the sidelines. I am uh, excited by this concept of scaling and the way he has come, you know, way he has uh, transformed IIM into a, uh, IIM Cori Code into a, uh, of an institute of stature. And uh, today, like we used, we used to say, I am ABC in the past, we say ABK now because of the recent rankings and uh, Cori Code just behind uh, Bangalore and I'm sure uh, it will go to higher heights as well. So, uh, good morning Devashish and you know, good morning, pleasure Rajesh. to have you. Appreciate your coming all the way from Bangalore to do this pleasure. event. And I can see that um, people are creeping in, but there are some good trees and some policemen out there. <laughs> I hope they would be listening in too. Yeah. All right. There's go a ahead. good audience as well. Can you, can you hear us clearly? All right, go ahead. So, uh, the first one was on the, the mission of uh, I am Cori Code on uh, globalizing Indian thought. And uh, what was the genesis of this idea and uh, how did you articulate that as the, the vision of the institute? All right. See, uh, when I first got into the Indian Institute of Management, I started my career in Calcutta. The first question that occurred in my mind, what is Indian about the Indian Institute of Management? And I found that there was very little Indian about Indian Institute of Management because we were towing the line of Harvard, MIT. Ahmedabad started with Harvard. I am Calcutta started with MIT. And so this precious little that was of Indian origin, whether it was our knowledge, it was the way we taught, the kind of students we got, and the kind of jobs they had, looking for top-end multinational organizations. So there was very little element of what you might describe as the India of the 1.4 billion people, there was very little of that. So the next question was, so how do I how do I Indianize Indians first? because our thinking is largely based on frameworks of the West. And so that was, the, that was the biggest challenge. And following that, one recognized that the global aspects of Indian thought existed much before management schools existed. Absolutely. India was globally known, you know, if you look at China, if you look at Japan, I was in Japan last month, I've been to China, I, see, I have seen inscriptions in Sanskrit in Shanghai, very close to Shanghai. I have seen in Japan many of the words that are used even in use, current usage of Indian origin. You go to several places in the Middle East, in the Far East, and you'll see the impact of India, global India. And so I said, why is it that we have lost that capability of influencing the world? What makes what makes it possible for us to revive India's leadership in the knowledge space, because we were knowledge leaders all the, all the way. You see, if you look at the Arabian Nights, look at Cinderella's story, look at Panchatantra, and you will see similarities. So we exported not just ideas and concepts, but also our own imagination to the world, rest of the world. So what would bring back that lost uh, glory, that, that fabulous past that we had. And the only way to do this is to look at the centers of aspiration of India. IITs, IIMs re represent more than institutions, they represent centers of aspiration. 300,000 people applying for 400 positions. So I said, if I can make 
the first… if I take the first step towards global impact of the IIM, people ask me, how do you recognize in Kunlamangalam on a hilltop you'll globalize Indian thought? Then I then ask the counter question, look, 300,000 people applying for 400 positions and you are representing the aspiration of 1.4 billion Indians, you represent 0.001% of the intellect of, you know, 1.4 billion Indians. So if you can't globalize Indian thought, who can really do that? Because on scale, we are already there. In terms of timeline, we already have had evidence from the past. What more do you need to usher in the global impact of Indian knowledge? That is how it began. Well, I can see some more people coming in and, the, and there's a tractor moving, which, sure. is, which makes for a good conversation. Yes, go ahead. I think, so, uh, now you, you've taught out here in India and you've taught in many countries uh, right. outside as well. Right. What is sort of missing in their worldview, which is there in perhaps Indian philosophy or the Indian management thought, so to say? You know, if you look at any uh, Indian cinema, you see there is something called suspension of disbelief. Yeah. <laughs> you can see a Bollywood, I can't say Bollywood, it's actually Indian cinema. Bollywood is a pejorative. So if you look at a Hollywood film, it follows a strictly rational structure. If you look at Indian cinema, there's a car chase, there's a courtroom scene and then hero and the heroine is breaking into a dance. There's no logical connection. So India is capable of grasping the fact that between fact and fantasy, between management and mythology, there must be a certain connection. You know, for instance, I have used music in my corridors. If you go to IIM, you'll see music in the corridors. And people ask me, what is the connection between music and management? I said, if you don't perform, in fact, one of my deans said that, if you don't perform, you face the music. And the point I'm trying to make is this, that for us to be able to synthesize disparate elements is a natural gift. The Western world is pretty linear. Look at Kumbh Mela. In Kumbh Mela, 10 million people every 10 years gather in one place. People are going to take a dip. If you looked at that kind of a gathering, it's larger than population of many countries in the world. If you look at that kind of a gathering, there is likely to be infectious diseases, there's likely to be stampede, people are likely to be killed. But nothing, nothing of that sort happens. Why? Because there is something that connects people towards… So you slow each other down. So if somebody wants to <laughs> get away from you in Kummela, you have to slow down because there's an assembly line. So we are capable of assembly line formats, provided you give me a rational, give me a purpose for doing that. In Kummela, the purpose is that this is a holy dip, everybody is a holy person and you are entitled to a dip, irrespective of whether you are a billionaire or you are a monk, right? And so that is the basic essence of the Indian thought that says that we can have an intuitive grasp of reality rather than linear logical grasp of reality. And then there is a flexibility in our response system. Whereas in many cities in the world there is to be a time when you drive on either on the right or the left. In Calcutta where I grew up you, you drove on whatever was left of the city. So you essentially drove in whichever space and you had to have a flexibility of approach in road sense. This is primed, look at Langar, look at Dhanda, look at some of the elements of Indianness in trade and commerce. You see the, the most important feature of Indian approach to managing enterprise is that you can get by in multiple ways, it's not just one way of doing things, multiple ways. So, we have a long-term view as well, we have a circular view of losses and gains. So if you lose, you don't lose heart to the extent that you wind up the business. You can see businesses thriving, striving and they turn around and there's a sense of investment in human capital. You know that if you invest in the right human capital, things will turn around. So you see businesses as, in terms of a cycle, cyclical nature of life that India is gifted with. For some reason we have this enormous gift that the West doesn't seem to have. So if there is a crisis in the West, there is a subprime crisis, 2008, 
economy collapses, the whole country collapses. Here we have seen demonetization, we have seen many kinds of collapses. Country does not collapse. There's a resilience that has called upon, you know, that it has invited scrutiny from the Western scholars, from our poets. You know, Iqbal's famous line, is dharti mein kya hai jo mitane se bhi mitti nahi. I'm, I'm not paraphrasing his, I'm simply paraphrasing his word. So what is it that in the soil that does not go away, even if, it go, even if everything seems hopeless? So this resilience of India, the average Indian, translates as sustainability principle in business, in politics, in commerce, in family. And so you can see this is the distinction, this is the departure. Whereas West sees linear life, we see non-linear, circular. Where West, West sees analytical stuff, we see intuitive. We have an intuitive grasp. Where the West is based on systems, we are, our basis is human-centered, largely. That gives us the leverage, which is huge. I hope I will respond no, to I that. I think it's, it's a very interesting point. You know, at times we... Uh, we fail to articulate uh, some of these differences and uh, uh, Debashish's book, which you know, we are getting into now, Leadership Chronicles, it's, uh, I, don't say it, I, I don't want to say it's an easy read. It's not an easy read <laughs> because it has enough and more for you to annotate, take notes, put post-its, whichever way you, you, know, you assimilate books the way you do. Uh, it, has, it has some very interesting aspects of his life as well. And one thing which sort of uh, stood out uh, was, I've read some of your earlier books. Uh, Invincible Arjuna was one of the books which we gifted to a lot of clients because we thought, you know, it, it, had, it had certain uh, very interesting elements of uh, Indian philosophy and Indian mythology and to connect it to management and, uh, you know, the ability to focus and things like that. This book has a lot more uh, biographical aspects and, you know, incidents from your life and things like that. So one question which was, which I kept asking myself when I read some of those things, how did you, uh, how do you remember a lot of such incidents in your life? I mean, there are so many of them and even uh, right from the time with your grandmother to, you know, to those incidences in airports and uh, colleges. So you, do you keep a log or do you write it down or? <laughs> okay. It's an interesting question. You know, the thing is that the res uh, let's look at the research first. Consistently, our research is telling us that the number one quality of a leader is self-awareness. And you'll see across the board, which simply means that you must learn how to be aware of the story of your life. Not Your life is different from the story of your life. By the way, your life is happening every moment. You know, your heart beating, your pulse is racing, you're breathing in and breathing out, you're alive. But that is not the story. The story is what you choose to tell. Absolutely. And a story of life is different from life itself. While you're telling a story, you take up elements of your life that you think is important for you and significant for others. Absolutely. So when you curate the story of your life, you recognize there's a pattern there. You lived a life not based on your whims and fancies. Live a life based on a coding that you had, you were born with certain orientation to life. Whether you love to read or eat, eat fish, curry or a pump, it is coded in your, in your life. You know, it, it has taken nature millions of years to make, you, to make you who you are. Now, if you don't understand the basic element of who you are, then any story that you tell will be second rate. And the moment you know who you are, then what happens is that you, know, you recognize that every experience of life, everything that you do is subjective in the ultimate analysis. Look at some people from the corporate world are here, I can see them. When you do a performance appraisal in the corporate world like you do, you know, there are forms to be filled. How is this person on team building, on leadership, on analytical skills? And you put marks in each of them and then you add up. But in reality, what happens is you decide whom to promote, then you put those marks. Are you with me? Yeah. So Mamta Banerjee is in seat sharing in, with Congress. 
Now she decides that she is going to give only two seats, then she will supply the logic behind it later on. But the decision is subjective. So if all our decisions are subjective, you must pay attention to the subjective. And I must tell you that the two people responsible for uh, so many stories and anecdotes, one is the Penguin editor, Radhika Marwa. She said, Devashis, this book should be first person singular. I said, I can't write about myself. <laughs> it's difficult to write about myself. So I had an, I have my dean, Deepa Shetty, she wrote to several people, including my son, and said, do you have something that you remember of this person? And so they all wrote back, surprisingly, you know, from all continents of the world. We got feedback from professional colleagues, from uh, my school uh, schoolmates, who I did not meet 20 years ago. All kinds of people contributed. And the last four sentences was from my son Siddharth. And so, essentially, all of them reflected on what this life was all about. And I put this together without editing, so that people know who this person is, uh, without reference to personal biases. So, I brought in these elements because people were requested to send their feedback. And within three months, we got about, you know, 150, 160 responses from around the world. So that was put together in the book. So I am presuming that when you look at the chronicles, you're not looking at just my view of myself. You're looking at a 360 degree view of your world and your reflections on it. And I think that's a fairly objective thing to do. And that's precisely what I did what, what, you know, in the book itself. Thanks. That's a, that's a very interesting point. I think it was Marquez or, you know, one of those uh, Latin American authors who probably wrote that yeah. your life is about uh, how, you, how you remember it and how you choose to tell it, not really about the experiences that you have. Very interesting, very interesting thought there. Mm. Uh, I, I don't consider you as an educator. I look at you as a very innovative entrepreneur, you know, in, in all sense of that word. Right. And you have done innovation in a sector which traditionally people think that education is one of those things that we've got from the centuries. Uh, and my daughter who does, uh, who does architecture, she says that even today education, uh, we, lose the, we lose that concept of education, but education is still uh, somebody teaching you below a tree. That's the, you know, that's the Indian way of looking at education. How did you think of bringing so many ideas into education and at the end of the day, even calling it a gurukul and you know, your, uh, the fabulous hall that you have in I am Kori Code, etc. How did those ideas come in and uh, were there moments of serendipity or were they part of a larger thought process? Yeah. See, I think entrepreneurship and education is one thing in common. We are in the business of wealth creation. We have not inherited wealth, we, are, we have to create wealth. Now, how do you create wealth that you've not inherited? The only way to do so is to look at what's between your ears and say, well, how do I re revisit this world where others see poverty, I see wealth. Where others see cow dung, I see gober gas plant. Where others see lemon, I see lemonade. How do you do that? And it's a function of vision, basically a function of vision. The vision that I had was that our intellectual capital once it is multiplied by social capital, becomes reputation capital. So how do you build I am Cory Cord's reputation as an institution? When we landed from Singapore uh, to the airport in Cory Cord, I asked the cab driver who was next to my car, I said, do you know where IIM is? He said, he doesn't know where IIM is. He said, there's something near MIT, there must be a campus. So he did not know the existence of the institution. A local driver. So I said, how does this institution get known globally? And the, be the best way to do that was to look at what is the challenge that we face as an institution of national importance. The first was, we had little access to the cities of India, forget about, you know, other things. The airplane connectivity to Delhi was once, a, you know, it was not even once a day. And so we said, and my predecessor who was the director before me said, it, if he had to attend a meeting in Delhi, he had to fly via Dubai to reach there early enough. So how do you beat the geographical constraint of running a business school where there is no business? So we went to the first D, which is digitization. We were the first IIM in 2001 that reached corporates across the country based on digital 
access. This is the first D. The second D was diversification of what we did. We said we are predominantly male members in the IM, all male engineers. That was the dominant trait in IM. So in 2013, we had 54%, 53.7% women as our, in our flagship program. And people stood up and said, okay, corporate said, we were looking for these women as entry-level managers, but IMs were not producing them. So when the average ratio of women coming into the IM was 8 to 10%, we had 50% women. Corporates made a beeline. Other IMs had to follow. They had no choice. So di diversification was not just gender diversity. You know, diversity in the number of programs. We are the first IIM to start an MBA in liberal studies. We are the first IIM to start a practice track PhD. And so diversification of the number of people who could come into the IIM system, digitization of our portfolio, and the final D was disruption of the IIM system itself. Whereas people used to have to go to the hilltop to go to an IIM, we said IIM should come to people. Like I have come to this book fair, not because I'm the director of IIM, but because I'm an author, I've written a book. My identity rests on a work of art. I hope you get a copy of this sometimes, okay? It has nothing to do with my, so you can see IIM is not even here. You know, there's no IIM here. There's no picture, there's no re reference to I am on the top of the book. Simply because our identity, like your identity, is that I am first an Indian, a citizen of the country, and I have be been given the trust of an institution built on taxpayers' money. You are paying taxes for the I am to come up. So I am responsible to you, to the average Indian, to see if I can make their lives slightly better. So this was the reason why we went entrepreneurial, because the best way to go through this is to simplify the rules of the game and amplify your thought leadership. How do I simplify? I said, you have three hills to climb. In Kundamangalam, we are on a hilltop, three hills. First hill is the hill of research. The second hill is the hill of teaching. The third hill is the hill of consulting, administration, etc. Now, you can choose one of the three hills. You may not be a great climber in all three hills, you choose one. You must be the best in that one. You have to excel in one. The others you can be okay, but one you have to excel. If you do ec excellent work in one dimension of life, you will be recognized everywhere. You know, Zakir Hussain is not known for cracking the cat exam, he's known for tabla. Tenulkar will be known for playing cricket, not for IIT joint entrance exam qualification. So whatever you're good at, if you put that forward first and everything else can support it, then you become entrepreneurial because entrepreneurship is about that creative energy that exists in you despite resource constraint, you can create something magnificent. And India is a prime example of that, resource crunch, yet you have a creative streak. You can see what's happening now. So entrepreneurship is in our blood. See, I was in South Africa and I was told something very interesting in South Africa. He said, if you give an Indian in a football match, if you give an Indian a corner, corner as in corner kick, he will open a shop in that corner instead of kicking the corner. You go to Antarctica, Antarctica, all the way close to Antarctica, there's only one shop that is run by Gujarati. He runs a shop that sells gear to survive the cold and he's staying, he's staying there. See, I was in north, northernmost part of Canada, a place called Ikalit. You have a snow desert everywhere, desert of snow. I thought I must be the first Indian to have come here. Four hours flying time from Ottawa. You can see it's close to the North Pole. So I go there, shivering in the cold and I look around and I say, I must be the first Indian, so let me put the Indian flag here. Then somebody said, you are invited to an Indian tea party. I said, Indian tea party? He said, Indian Guru Sishi Ravi Shankar is doing an art of living here near the North Pole. <laughs> so you can see, where have you not gone? <laughs> I mean, you can reach the unreached, you can do the undone. You can, you see, Indian climb the uh, Tenzing Norgays are not just on the mountain climbing, they're in the business. You know, Rajesh Nair uh, is doing something entrepreneurial in growing EY in the way only he can grow. So our, you see, our basic genetic code 
is entrepreneurial in nature because we have to fight resource constraints everywhere in life. You know, a story, Rajesh, I'll finish with the story that I often like to share. You know, my, uh, my first visit to the United States of America, I'm, I'm glad that the room is filling up. I asked a question to my audience in America and the, and the question was, what does half-boiled egg mean to you? Half-boiled egg. And the Americans were stunned by the question, but one of them said, I, egg boiled for half the usual time. I said, no, it's a fully boiled egg cut in two halves with a string so that they look e almost equal by a mother who is giving two halves to two children so that there's no sibling rivalry, no dispute over the size of the egg. That's what was my tiffin for my school, right? You can see a mother is an entrepreneurial agent because she has to make do with so much of resource constraint in an Indian family. I'm not talking about Indian families of today, Indian families that were their middle class aspirational family like I came from. And so if you think entrepreneurship is only a function of a corporate life or an IIM or IIT education, that's not true. There's entrepreneurship in every nook and corner. You just have to look around. You just have to look around. Yeah. I'm looking at the time. So uh, a quick question to wrap up before we pick up a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, when do you find time to read, write? And uh, an adjunct question also is, uh, you also like movies and listen to music. When do you find time for all this? Is there a only Devashi sort of time in your regular <laughs> schedule? You know, the thing is, um, my passion is writing. So I used to have a routine, not anymore. No breakfast until I've written 250 words. No breakfast if there is no 250 words on my screen or on my copy book. And I did fairly well because I used to write a column in Times of India I was read by four million people. I had to write that you know, before breakfast. So that was my discipline for writing. And very very often people ask me about my thinking time. I, you know, thinking is not what produces writing. In fact, you have to reduce the number of thoughts per minute in order to write. That's why when I write, I don't think, I write. You know, I was, when I was not Great a writer, point. I was just out of university and I was crazy about writing. So I went to several people for advice as to how to write. And they said, all kinds of advices came. You should write when you're inspired, you should write in the morning, you should write in the evening. Only one man gave me an advice which I could really follow. He said, his name is Kushban Singh, he passed away. He wrote 98 books. He said, the only way to write is to write. There's no other way. So he said, that's the only way to write. Then I must write 250 words before I eat breakfast. Well, I do write a lot. I also see movies, at least a couple of movies every week. The one that I'm seeing now, uh, is Kalapani. There's a lot to learn from indigenous life that impacts our modern life. This is about Andaman Islands, Kalapani. And I've recently seen a film um, called Twelfth Fail. You might wonder why should an IM director look at a book called Twelfth Fail? Yeah, yeah. Because that's the kind of people that we want in our system. People who don't fail because they want to fail, people fail because they have other good things to do. So we want entrepreneurs in our system. So I'm trying to see if I can revamp I am admission policy to look at people who have not succeeded in academic but could make a huge impact in life. And so that's my orientation now. Sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks, we are completely out of time. We'll take one question or we'll actually close, uh, you know, the no. organizers. No, Yeah. ask a question. 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 There will always be one question. Yes, I know it is over but the question… The just, just one question. Yeah. One question, yes. I appreciate that. Please, you've, you've already wasted our time. Please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Sir. Your question, is there a mic there? Hello. See uh, how? Good, good, good morning, sir. Yeah. Sir, this side. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Sir, you uh, talked about uh, being the, the Indian, Indian way of uh, managing in the, in the corporate system, like, which is human-centric human rather than process-centric. Process so this is this is an in inherent uh, uh, what what do I, what do I say? Uh, there is a contradiction. Yeah, come to your question. Come to your question. So my question is like whatever we whatever we are taught in a in a management school in the cases everywhere we are taught to follow the process oriented. We are pushed towards the yeah. process oriented way of thinking, structured way, mental models, 
right. all the theories and then there is that uh, the pride that we take in the human centric way of managing the, the colloquial jugaad indian jugaad so how do we reconcile uh, these two things you know there is a process involved in human centric work as well there is a process involved why a human being does what he does there is a rational behind it you may assume that process is only a system beyond the human being the human beings have created that process there is a natural intelligence behind all processes artificial intelligence has taken up the process and converted a formula into a result but a human being is not defined by a formula human being is defined by what he can create at that moment so look at a grocer in an indian grocery store he does not follow any specific process but he can take care of the seller the buyer people who are haggling for a price so he does so many things multi processes happening since we have short for short of time i'll take the rest of the questions later thank you for allowing this this was for the audience we thought at least we'll have one question uh thank you sir